Thank you, Melinda. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen. Thank you for joining us. I am very excited to present today. Um, so we're going to be discussing best practices for um, teaching online. Uh, my name is Yexenia Delgado Lorenzo, and I work um, at several agencies, actually. And I'm also a student at USC. I'm currently um, working on my doctorate um, in online learning. So I'm going to just be sharing some empirical research and some best practices um, that we uh, that we know um, work out in the field. Um, so I wanted to get started um, with a quote, and it says, "Technology will never replace great teachers, but technology in the hands of." of a great teacher can be transformational. So that's one of the things that I've learned um, just teaching online. I've been teaching online for the last um, six years and I do a, a, a flipped classroom setting where my students do all of the learning online and we just meet once a week for labs. So that's what I've been focusing on for the last um, couple of years, just trying to figure out ways on how I can engage my students um, what are the best practices online and how I can get my students to be actively involved in their learning. Um, so today's agenda, um, we're going to be reviewing um, empirical best practices in online teaching. And then as we go along, feel free to ask questions. Um, I want this to be more of an interactive um, presentation where we can um, learn from each other and kind of share best practices that we're using as well. So feel free to um, ask any questions as we go through. Um, so as we go through, we want to discuss how we can apply these best practices in our classroom. Okay, so I'm going to get started. Um, so one of the first practices that we know um, we need to have in the online setting is we need to be present in the course. Um, so the liberal use of instructors, use of communications tools um, are going to be important to use, such as announcements, the discussion board, postings, the forums to communicate with students. Um, those are going to be important because that is what shows our students that we care about their questions. So unlike in an on-class setting where you present yourself every day and they can see you, in an online setting, um, the only way they can see you is if you're actually interacting in some of the forums. So one of, um, there was um, some surveys that went out to students and they surveyed about 1,200 students and they asked students um, what makes the best online faculty and instructors. And what we found from that study was that um, they, show their they show their presence in the classroom multiple times a week. And uh, a lot of the students said that the best instructors show their presence daily. So I think that's going to be important that we're consistently um, chatting in the forums. If we ask a question, I'm um, going back into the forum and um, kind of uh, discussing the question with them as we go along or as we would do in a regular classroom. So we also want to know that we set clear expectations as to um, when we uh, will be answering those questions. So setting course policies is going to be really helpful to reduce um, the need for the daily presence. Um, one of the things that I found in the beginning, I, um, I set myself open to, oh, I'll answer questions all the time. I'm always available for you. And I quickly realized that, um, you know, some of my students were messaging me at 10 p.m. or 11. So you also want to set up the particular times of when you're going to be able to answer questions, letting your students know, you know, my office hours for, are from 8 in the morning to 6 p.m. And, you know, you don't want um, to be overwhelmed with so many questions where you feel the pressure to answer questions late at night or very early in the morning. So you can um, technically set up your own hours. That way your students know when you're going to be in your class. Um, when you have office hours, when, um, you know, when do they expect an answer for some of those questions that they may have? Um, what we want to do is by um, being present in the course, um, we show a supportive and caring um, relationship with our students, and that's going to help increase their attributions. So as we increase their attributions through a caring and supportive relationship, we begin to build a community of learners. Um, so our presence in the course can be 
um, showing through clear expectations, our set of policies, setting up those regular hours. Um, so this is what's gonna help our students understand. Um, we can also make sure that they're aware as to when and how we're gonna be answering those questions. Do you only answer questions posted in the forum versus do you prefer email questions or you know, do you prefer your students texting you questions? Those are gonna be your limitations and your expectations that you have in your class. And that's very similar to what we do in a real face-to-face -face classroom. Um, so that's gonna be invaluable when it comes to um, you setting up your classroom management online. So that was practice number one. So we wanna be present in the course. Practice number two is to create a supportive online environment. So some of the things that we want to do is that we want to make sure that we develop a good strategy for developing a supportive, supportive online course community um, by uh, making sure that we have balanced set of dialogues. So we want dialogues between the faculty and the student, the student and the student, but then also the student and the resources. This means designing a course um, where all three dialogues with faculty, student, student to student, and faculty to student, student to resources are all about equal. We want them to be able to communicate um, with the three um, resources. So a teacher to student, we can do this by many lectures um, in text or in video. So right now we can use different video tools to record ourselves doing a lecture. We can also do a PowerPoint with a voiceover. So there's different ways that we can create that lecture um, to our students to create that teacher to student um, learning. Also weekly um, coaching or reminder announcements work really well. So these, we can do a weekly, um, one of the things that I do for my classrooms is I, um, I do a weekly uh, video where I um, videotape myself and I just kind of tell my students, welcome to this week, this is what we'll be learning, um, this is the assignments that will be due. Um, and I kind of give them direct direction for the week. And that is something that my students have actually, um, you know, commended me on and have said that they really appreciate that weekly um, video with explanations of what is going to happen this week. Um, explanations, interactions with other students. So we want to give them that, um, you know, the opportunity to ask questions to us or to provide um, interaction time with us as well. So, um, as well as our feedback. Our feedback is also gonna be important when we are guiding our students in their learning. So another way for our student to student, um, we wanna make sure that we offer some uh, social presence. So these three strategies um, can be used to encourage students um, engagement and building course community in online learning we want to make sure that we develop these three types of presence, um, social teaching and cognitive presence. Um, so some of the things that we can do is launch the class with a personal introduction posting so that the students can get to know one another. Um, where are the students? Um, where are their heads at? Like, what are they thinking at that moment? Um, some types are often shared to include, um, you know, as we uh, gain, um, as we gain momentum in our online learning, we also want to make sure that our students um, connect with us professionally. So we want to share about our own um, struggles and our own professional experience. And um, we want to set up forums for our students as well, where maybe you can create an open forum um, in the beginning of your class where students can request help or assistance from each other. Um, this will also help with some of the problem solving um, students are usually very good at helping each other and answering each other's questions. One of the things that I usually do is I leave an open forum and maybe uh, add extra credit for it um, where the students are able to ask any questions and then other students can come in and answer those questions. And that really helps with the classroom management as well because a lot of the questions that some of the students are asking are questions that other students can answer, so they don't have to be directly answered by an instructor. Um, so we also wanna set up small groups where students can assume responsibility for supportive mentoring of each other. 
Um, so that's going to be helpful if you use a room like Zoom um, and you can create those small groups where they can work with each other and then come back and share with the class. Um, that's going to be another way to create that student to student interaction. Yes, Anya? Okay. Yes. So this is Anthony from OTAN. Um, we have a couple of questions. Would you okay. like to take them now or? Sure. Okay. So, and I'm going to kind of work a little bit backwards here. Okay. So you were just speaking about forums. Um, mm -hmm. So a couple of questions. Um, where would you recommend setting up a forum? And then what kinds of forums are useful? Or do you, you know, are they just forums or are they different kinds of forums? We'll start with that question. Okay, so the forums can be set up um, depending on the learning management system that you are using. I usually have a forum that I set up in the beginning of the course where it's just the general forum to ask questions about the learning management system. And that's usually, um, you know, in, in like the very first week of the course where I set that up. But as you create each lesson, what I do is I usually have an open forum for every week. So as I give, um, you know, the weekly assignments, there is an open forum for that week where students can ask specific questions about what they're learning that week. Um, so you would set that up in each learning management system differently, but it's usually like a chat, right? It's like a dialogue between students where everybody can see um, what everybody else is typing and being able to ask and answer questions. Um, and those um, seem very helpful because sometimes um, they might get to a worksheet that they don't understand and they might just ask a question specifically to that worksheet and another student will come in and give them the answer. So that's um, part of them helping each other. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, um, in, uh, are, your, are the students um, in the class using computers, laptops, their cell phones? Um, is there anything that you need to, um, you know, consider in terms of the student devices as you're, as you're doing the things that you're doing, suggesting? Um, so again, it really um, depends on the learning management system that you're using, but a lot of my students do 90% of their learning on their cell phones because there's an application for the learning management system that is a link in their cell phones. Um, so all of these strategies um, can be used in a blended classroom, in a flipped classroom, or in a 100% online classroom. And really the devices that they're going to use is going to depend on what is supported by that learning management system that you're using. Okay, thank you. And then um, Yesenia, the last question. So I think this is just in general as you're giving your presentation today, are you going to distinguish between um, different groups of students. So we have one person and probably a few others who are asking about, um, you know, what about the lowest ESL literacy students, for example? Um, or are these just kind of best practices for all groups of students? Um, so there are best practices that we've found in research that have worked across all levels of adult learners. So we're basically focusing on adult learners. When we talk about, um, you know, ESL literacy students, um, we're going to have to modify our strategies just a little bit only because of the language barriers, right? But we can still um, use a lot of these strategies to help the um, literacy students because we can, um, for example, an activity where we would have students um, post a dialogue um, you know, there's a lot of our learning management systems also allow for the students to record their audio. So maybe we're having the students record um, an audio of pronunciation of words, or we would try and make activities that are easier for them. Um, for example, uh, you know, um, what, how old are you, or what is your name, or what did you eat today? So we would just put um, simpler questions that would be able um, they would be able to answer based on their learning at that specific moment. So we would just have to modify, um, you know, the, the type of question that we're asking. But the strategies that we're going over are pretty much used across adult ed from literacy to career technical to, um, you know, um, higher education as well. Okay. Um, 
So we're gonna move on to practice number three. And then Anthony, just let me know if any other questions come up. Um, so we wanna make sure that we, another best practice um, that we've learned um, is that we wanna make sure that we share clear expectations for your students and for yourself. Um, one of the key things that um, we've learned is that a lot of students don't do certain things or they do not um, follow directions because as, as instructors, we didn't provide them with that expectation or clear directions on what was expected for them to do. So this practice um, cannot be overemphasized. We wanna make sure that we include in our course site a set expectation of how students will communicate and dialogue online and how they will communicate with you. Um, for example, many faculty members tell their students that they can expect the response within 24 hours. Online learning is just as intensive as face-to-face -face learning. Um, so it, it, we're basically looking at teaching the same thing, except it's through a different um, format, right? So we wanna make sure that we um, schedule the needs just as if we would be planning for a face-to-face -face class. So being clear as to how much effort and time will be required on a weekly basis keep surprises to a minimum, and that will also help with your classroom management as you move forward um, in your course as well. So another best practice is to use a, var a variety of large group and small work um, group and individual experiences. So, um, as we grow in online learning, which, which is fairly new, this is um, online, online learning or e-learning um, is a new experience for a lot of instructors. So a community works well when there are a variety of activities and experiences. So online courses um, can be more enjoyable and effective when students have the opportunity to brainstorm and work through concepts and assignments with more than um, one other student. Um, a lot of the courses that um, are online primarily focus on individual work because we um, wanna make sure that they're able to complete that task individually. But we can also embed other um, practices within um, the same lesson that would allow them to do group work um, together, even though they're doing it at different times. So if they're building a story, for example, we can have multiple people add to that story, or we can create, um, you know, a partner activity where they have to complete a certain task with other individuals. Um, so we want to build on options and opportunities for students to work, work together. Um, as well as individually. So we want to mix it up, right? We don't want just all group activities or just all individual activities like we do in the classroom, but we really want to mix it up to create that engagement. One of the things that we know from research is that collaborative learning um, allows for opportunities for both social and academic goals. So a lot of the times the family that you build within your online course is going to be supportive to each other and we create those connections with each other and kind of um, keep track of each other as we're moving through the course. So we wanna make sure that we're actively interacting and engaging the students, but that other students are actively interacting and engaging with each other and developing those intellectual and personal bonds. Um, the, same the same type of bond that would happen in a face-to-face -face class, we wanna be able to um, create that same bond in the classroom itself. So one of the things that I um, usually do um, when I, when I uh, start my course online is I partner up the students into groups of maybe three or four. Uh, and then I have the students exchange email um, information with each other. And I let them know that that's gonna be their partners for our course and they're gonna be working together and to encourage each other, help each other out. Um, if you don't see your, partner um, log in to the face, you know, to the online learning class, um, ask them where they're at, um, kind of hold each other accountable. And that has worked really well in my online classes where there is bonds created within each other. And then sometimes um, we have Zoom classes that we meet on. And if I don't see someone, I'll say, okay, who's talked to um, a specific student and where is he at? 
and the other students will know right away, oh, he had a dentist appointment or he's taking care of his mom or they, you know, they let me know where the student is at. So creating that family bond is going to be important in them keeping track of each other and kind of helping each other get through the course. Um, Another best practice uh, is to have both um, synchronous and asynchronous activities. So the same thing that we were talking about earlier, we don't want just one type of activity, but multiple online courses almost always use individual activities. And it's important to use the tools in the course management system, such as having a virtual live classroom through Zoom or through Google Hangouts, or um, utilizing the audio tools on the learning management system to make it possible to do things that we would do in the actual classroom. So plus we can often engage learners in more collaborative and reflective activities um, because most of our learning management systems or a lot of our um, video uh, live classes, we're able to record them and the students are able to go back and review those classes as well. So there's nothing better than real-time interactive brainstorming and sharing and discussing. So for example, um, you know, bringing in a case study to your online classroom and having the students problem solve it, ask questions, review, um, is gonna be uh, effect, an effect experience for them. And really what we're doing at that point is we're kind of scaffolding, right? We're kind of, allowing them to learn something online, bringing it into the classroom, um, asking questions from each other. So what we're doing is we're building their self-efficacy. We wanna provide instruction um, early on to build multiple opportunities for practices where they, you know, we're kind of taking off um, the different uh, layers of their learning and they're building their own self-efficacy um, to motivate themselves. So really as the student feels that they can do more and more online, then they're gonna be able to meet those challenges. So maybe when you first, um, as we're developing our courses, because I know a lot of us right now, we kind of switched from face to face to online. Um, we start with simple activities. Maybe we just start with a forum post. And then our next activity might be a matching activity. But as the students are learning the, how to use the learning management program that we're utilizing with them, we wanna start off slow and easy and kind of scaffold to the bigger projects that we want them to do. Um, another practice is early in the course. Yes. Yeah. yes. Sorry, this <laughs> yeah. is Anthony. No, let's, no, let's... Okay. Yeah, let's take a break because we do okay. have a couple of questions. Maybe you can circle back to um, sure. some of the things that you were talking about. Um, again, we're going to kind of take these a little bit out of order. But okay. um, so for one question was, um, so speaking about ESL students in particular, the question is, what language would you use to explain your expectations? So uh, my, my first thought is actually we'll use English, but <laughs> what about, what, um, would you have, do you have anything to say about using other languages? Yeah, so the same language that you would use in a face-to-face -face classroom. So we want to use um, words that they will understand, very easy um, language, that, just like when you stand in front of your classroom and you explain your classroom expectations, you want to make sure that what you're writing um, or what you're putting in that post or you know the the expectations for the classroom um, whether it's your syllabus your course outline or you know a, an announcement that you're making to your class you want to make sure that you're using language that's comprehensible right so we want to make sure it's uh, easy for them to understand um, the other great thing I think when we use online a lot of our students are using translators right so um, some of uh, the language that we give them um, is easily translated to their own language. Okay, Yesenia, and I'll just, actually, I'll just um, second something you said early yeah. on about the power of video. Um, yes. I think if, if, you, if you have the means of actually um, making a video of what you're communicating to the students, it's, it's really powerful and it gives, it's, it's additional support that you've been speaking about, so. Sorry, that's just a little parent. No, little no, comment. it's true. I, I think video, even with, um, I, I've taught a literacy class online before, 
And even with a worksheet, you know, if you are able to record yourself in a video and explain very slowly how to do a worksheet, um, a lot of the times it's easier for them because they can come back to the video um, and re-listen to it and watch it again as you're explaining how to, how to do something online. Okay, and then another question, Yesenia, is what about students who have disabilities? So how do you, what are some of the things that you can do um, to accommodate students who have disabilities? Um, I think when we talk about students with disabilities, we, we would be using um, the same tools that we use face to face. I think um, if we know a specific student needs more time to do something or, you know, if you are teaching a, a career technical class and you have an ESL learner, then you're going to have to front load some information. You're going to, um, you know, if you have any additional worksheets, you might want to email them to them individually or um, you may want to uh, provide one-on-one -on -one support um, separately, but I think um, depending on the disability, we just wanna make sure that it's accessible to them just like we would do in a face-to-face -face classroom. Um, and there's just so many disabilities that we can discuss, right? Um, I think it just really depends on the type of disability and what support systems did you use in your classroom? And we just have to think critically of how we're gonna modify that to work online. Okay, and you're saying, let's take one more question at the moment here. Um, what, about, what about the case where um, there's, there might be like bullying or maybe not good online etiquette amongst the students? How do, um, how do you address that? Um, wow, so bullying, and, and I, I think that's something that we need to address in the very beginning as part of our expectations. And I think that's gonna come to also through your monitoring. Right, if we um, monitor the classroom, and, and I've seen many courses where teachers post a question and then they never log back in to check the answers. Like they just let the students, you only see student responses through those questions. So as an instructor, um, you wanna make sure that you are actively um, engaged in the classroom online as well. Like you're actively checking the forums, you're actively checking the discussions that is happening. And if there is any bullying, then we need to, directly, um, you know, talk to that specific student and kind of, um, you know, do the same thing that we would do in a face-to-face -face classroom where an expectation that we have from our students to be respectful and it's not going to be allowed or tolerated. So I think if the student continues um, or if it's something um, very serious, then administration would need to get involved in that process. Okay, thank you, Yusenia. We'll, I want you to continue and then we'll circle back to some more questions. Okay, um, okay so we have, um, so going back to our practice number six, and I think this is really important, especially as we're just starting to develop our courses online. Um, we want to do early check-ins throughout our course and get feedback. So how is the course going for the students? Um, do they have suggestions? Um, one of the things that this becomes really important and several of the online courses that I have built have been, I am a step ahead of the student. So I'm a chapter ahead. I'm building um, this week's material for next week. Um, and this becomes important because as we're building material and as we're developing our courses, we may miss something. And student feedback is really important. A lot of the courses um, have evaluations, but the evaluations are at the end. So they're done after the fact, once the students have left or have completed that specific course and nothing can be um, changed to increase their satisfaction anymore or to facilitate learning for them in the class they just completed. So early feedback and surveys um, is uh, going to be a discussion and it's going to be something that students are able to provide that feedback as well as how well is the course working for them. What might they, um, how can we make the course a better experience for them? So the early feedback is going to be important because then you're able to modify and change and this is, this is something that um, you know, we should get used to getting from our students because every class of students is gonna be different and there's gonna be different needs for that class. So one of uh, a really good practice is just to ask them, how is the course doing? Do you need more instruction? Do you need an, 
you know, additional videos um, and see what type of feedback you're gonna get from them. Um, practice number seven is to prepare um, a discussion, um, discussion post to, sorry, let me go back, I apologize. So we wanna make sure that our discussion post um, offer inviting questions. So this is gonna be their opportunities for them to reflect and to kind of think. One of the good things um, that I love about online is when we're face to face, we ask a question to our students and most of the time they have to come up with an answer fairly quickly. I um, mean, online, they get the opportunity to actually view the question and they can take some time, think about what they're gonna write and come back. So that really provides them a time for reflection. So discussions in an online course are equivalent to class discuss discussions, except I feel that it kind of gives them that additional time that they need to reflect on those questions. So a key difference is that um, the time process for the thought and the reflection, the written, um, whatever, if they need to do an uh, essay, then they kind of have a little bit more time to reflect and ask questions before they complete that specific activity. Um, so some of the things that we know from research or that have been recommended is to provide the open question forum, which we've discussed. So we want to model good um, probing questions. So the type of questions would be like, why do you think that? So as they're answering, right, as they're answering the question that you pose, that you um, post for them in the forum, then um, we would ask the same type of questions that we do um, in person, right? So we wanna, um, the Socratic type of questions, asking questions to clarify that encourage students to think about what they know and don't know. We also wanna, um, one of the things that I learned early on is we wanna scatter due dates and responses. So for example, um, if you're gonna do a forum and they have to post uh, something to your question by Friday and respond to two classmates, then if everybody waits until Friday to put their original post, then classmates don't have that much time to go in and review the questions. So maybe um, the original post is due on Wednesday and that gives classmates two days to review those posts and ask questions or reply to their classmates. Provide guidelines and instruction on responding um, to students. So, um, especially, this is gonna be how they're gonna um, answer those questions back. So, an example, maybe we want our students to do a two-part response. Um, we want them to share what they liked or agreed about somebody's post, what resonated with them. And two, we also want them to ask a follow-up question, such as what are they wondering or what are they curious about or what other, um, what uh, made them think critically about that original post. Um, we wanna provide them with choices and options. So that's another thing that I do. Sometimes I will post two or three different questions and I will ask students to um, discuss a minimum of one question from the three choices. Try to limit questions that solicit basic facts um, or questions that are just yes or no. So as we're posting these questions, we wanna make sure that there's questions that will um, develop dialogue um, something that they, um, you know, that they're talking about, um, not just something that they can answer with a yes or a no. Um, so practice number eight, we want to focus content resources and links to current events and examples that are easily assessed from the learner's computers. So as we know, um, our students don't have books right now, or most of our students don't have books because a lot of our adult education classes have class set of books. So they're not walking around with their book or if they purchase the book, it's not easily accessible to them everywhere. So if content is not digital, it is, um, or it doesn't, um, it really doesn't exist for the students when we're um, trying to uh, work through an online course. This means that content that, stu the, that the students are more likely to use is gonna be content that is accessible online. So it could be a link to an article or it can be a, um, you know, a PDF that you have uploaded for them, something that they're able to access from their application um, that is available on their computer or on their cell phone. 
Students um, want to be learning everywhere, anytime, and often they are doing multiple things as they are learning. So content that is mobile can be accessed via their smartphones or tablets, um, are usually welcomed a lot better by students. So maybe um, utilizing you know, some of the articles that are on the news to post for your students, um, they will be more likely to read that than to pull up a paper um, that they need to read if they're kind of learning on the go. As we're doing that, we wanna make sure that the course that we're building for them is also relevant. Um, we want to build their expectancy value and we wanna provide them with importance of what they're learning. So are we providing a lesson that they need in real life? Um, something that they're gonna use um, in the future and as they see value for that individual task that we're teaching them, it develops um, positive values for them as to why they need to learn it. All right, um, we're gonna move to practice number nine. So combining core concept learning with customized and personal learning. So this best practice combines a number of basic learning principles explained in length in other resources. Um, very briefly, it means that faculty identify the core concepts um, to be learned in the course the performance goals, and then mentor learners through the set of increasingly complex and customized projects, applying these core concepts. So supporting learners with their personal goals that are closely linked to the performing goals of the course, and even beyond the course parameters, the win-wins for the students and individuals in the class. So as we develop the, our, our learning um, online, we want to make sure that we also link it, right? And as our instructors are, are teaching this material, the more we're able to personalize the learning for our students as we discussed for our literacy students, um, and the more we are able to meet um, our students' goals, um, we uh, are able to engage them in our classroom. So we know from Vygotsky that concepts um, are not works, but rather organized intricate knowledge clusters, right? So another key principle um, that aids in the concept of learning from Vygotsky is that um, we want to make sure that, um, but rather than being organized and in intricate knowledge clusters, we want to make sure that they're able to do the tasks that we are asking them to do. So this is simple. Um, it's a simple but profound principle. So this means that while we must teach in a linear fashion, presenting concepts individually and in clusters, we need to apply concepts to real life scenarios, right? We need to um, be able to embed what they're learning and what they're gonna be utilizing. So a popular new teaching technique and learning mantra advocates making students thinking visible so making our thinking visible requires students to create, talk, write, explain, analyze, judge, report, and inqu um, inquire. So these activities make it clear what students know. Such activities stimulate students' growth from concept awareness to concept acquisition. So the discussion forums, the blogging, the journals, the small group work are all excellent strategies for engaging students in clarifying and enlarging their mental models or concepts and building links and identifying relationships with what they already know. Um, so again, we're, we're talking about scaffolding, right? Um, what, what knowledge do they have right now? What can we use upon the knowledge that we know our students had um, before we had to go online? Um, we also want to build on interest, so um, this becomes activating and building upon interest um, to increase that motivation for them to continue to do the online course. So interest and motivation are going to be really important um, for us because our students are to that face-to-face -face learning environment, and now we're moving them to an online environment. So um, they need to see that expectancy value, right? They need to know that um, once they complete the course, 
um, they're taking some knowledge that they need with them. And we wanna be um, able to tell our students, um, you know, what uh, their learning is important. At the same time, we wanna be able to find um, learner-friendly uh, training materials or learner-friendly activities that are clear and coherent um, that they will understand as we go through this online process with them. So some of the principles um, for processing information that we know from research is that the, what we teach them needs to be meaningful, meaningful and connected to prior knowledge. So we need to tap into prior knowledge as we're building these lessons online. The practice has to be frequent um, to develop that mastery and use metacognitive strategies to assist in becoming um, self-regulated. So as we're building our lessons online, we talked about the scaffolding, you know, making it simple. Um, maybe the first task is to do a discussion forum with them. Um, and then the second time it's to do a discussion forum and reply to a classmate. Maybe the third task is to do a discussion forum, just, you know, reply to a classmate and upload a video of a task that you're asking them to do. Um, so those are gonna be things that are, you know, gonna be helpful in their learning process as we scaffold through the assignments as well. Um, in that same practice, we wanna make sure that um, the parts are manageable. So especially right now, as um, we go through, um, you know, this unprecedented, unprecedented event um, in our society, um, how much can our students manage? Um, so we need to know our students and how much can um, we give them or how much knowledge do we want to give them without overloading them? Um, and we also want to um, give them uh, activities um, that maybe they already know, like pre-learning activities where it's a review of what you've learned in the class in the beginning and once we engage our students with the review then we can start teaching small um, clusters of different things and adding them online. Um, Anthony I'm going to go ahead and um, go through some of the questions before I move to the last um, practice. Okay. Um... There was some questions. Oh, so this is kind of something you talked about a little bit earlier, but so um, many students, I'm sure, and sometimes even some teachers are not able to work alone when they're on the computer. So do you have any suggestions for, um, you know, this situation, just students, you know, sitting in their homes or looking at their phones and working alone? Um, having, having to do with like collaboration or things like that? So a lot of the students are going to work alone. I think when we talk about the collaborative learning, it's going to be more with other students that are taking the course at the same time online. Um, so it, it's creating, um, you know, an environment where maybe if they're going to do like a small project or one of the things that I did with my students um, in the very beginning was um, they had to do one um, one PowerPoint slide and one PowerPoint slide, just one page was done by three students. So they all um, had an opportunity to help each other. Um, so even though the students are doing it at different times, they can all log into a Google slide at different times and help each other build it by leaving each other notes or texting each other. So I think most of the collaborative activities are gonna be um, individuals learning alone, but in an environment where they can communicate with others within their own classroom. Okay, so Yesenia, along those lines, there was another question about, um, do you have any recommendations for the frequency of meeting in quotations online? Um, I think it really depends on your course and, um, you know, how your course is moving. For a lot of my courses, um, you know, I, I truly um, believe in the flipped classroom model. So a lot of my courses only met once a week. Um, but again, the frequency of the meeting is going to depend on the type of course that you're teaching and, um, you know, how often your students are able to meet as well. Um, if we were going from, you know, four day a week class, then maybe um, transitioning to just meeting online twice a week 
um, right? Um, as they become comfortable. And then in the beginning, you're really going to be reviewing a lot of the learning management system that you're expecting your students to use. So maybe um, for the first couple of weeks, you have two sessions a week, and then you can transition to one, um, or you can go the other way. Um, maybe you want to see how many students um, come into your classroom once a week, and then as you see the need, then you keep adding more face-to-face -face time with them as well. Um, so I think the number of sessions is really going to depend on the type of course that you're teaching. Okay. And Yesenia, um, I just want to tell you, um, you don't necessarily have to answer this right now. Maybe you can finish your presentation mm -hmm. and circle. But I think in general, there are kind of two um, big questions that many of the participants have. One is a, a question about basically the level of technology skills that students and teachers have, also the level of access to technology devices and internet that students and teachers have. So how do you address some of those issues? And then the other big question is, um, seems to be like, okay, you know, for many people, probably the majority of people across the state, like this is a brand new experience, right? Mm -hmm. Both the students and the teachers. So you've given us a lot of things to think about and I think a lot of great practices but okay if you're just starting out maybe what is it that we focus on you know among all the things that you talked about and again so, if you if you want to maybe if you want to finish your presentation yeah. and then we can kind of circle know, yeah. back to those two big questions but i think you know um it would be nice to hear some of your thoughts about again sort of the level of access to technology and digital literacy skills amongst students and teachers and then also right. this question of like, okay, so now you, you've given us a lot of things to think about, kind of where do we start if we're also just starting ourselves? Um, I think the technology access, um, and, and most of us know our students, so that's gonna be the, the platform that we use to teach our classes. So I've um, seen instructors use, um, applications like Remind, where it's more of a text-based application, um, and they're able, you know, I've, or another application that I've um, used in the past um, with literacy students specifically was WhatsApp. Um, WhatsApp, I think it is, so it's more of a texting app, and how we used it was every day I, you know, sent out a question, a very easy question, or it was, um, you know, today we're gonna send a picture of, um, you know, somewhere in your community. Um, so then students would text back pictures and they would also um, text back the answer to their question. So maybe it's not, if you know your population of students um, does not have internet access, then maybe we can consider using a application um, like a texting application. Um, the other way, if, if they have limited access as well, or there's not a learning management system because um, technology uh, isn't accessible to a lot of the older population, then possibly um, just the website that's already set up, utilizing some of the resources that are already out there um, to learn English. Um, so for example, there's, um, you know, I can share um, with those that want it, there's a link to like a virtual dictionary that shows pictures and then the word of, uh, and the word and the pronunciation. So maybe we, um, our assignment is to go in and through the picture dictionary and focus on fruits. So then they're going to go through fruits and learn the words, how to pronounce them with the pictures. And it's just a link that they're clicking on from their phone. Um, and I'm not sure if I uh, answered that question directly. So if there's more specific questions, just let me know and we can go through them at the end. Um, and I can share some of the resources that I use specifically for ESL teachers. Um, and I can share a link that I have that has um, multiple uh, resources as well. Yes, and yet, um, before you move on yeah. to number 10, so we, we actually have a couple of questions about what you just presented in nine. So okay. one question is, could you just could you just quickly repeat the three steps or the examples of how to scaffold up? And then the other question was, can you repeat the list of learning activities when you talked about information processing? Um, so let me go back. 
Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I thought we were just in number nine. <laughs> oh, sorry. I want to say, okay, so, um, and I, I can send the presentation with my notes to everyone because now I'm a little bit like, hold on, where was I at? Um, so the list, it was the list for processing I information. I yeah. believe, yes. This one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the principles for processing information, um, I, I think this is what, I forgot what I discussed at this point, but um, we want to make sure that um, information is meaningful and connected to prior knowledge. Um, the freaking the frequent practice, um, I think I discussed um, starting with a very simple activity, so especially for learners that are just getting comfortable with technology, um, starting off with just a simple post, a video of them, um, of them um, working through it might not be the, the first thing that we want them to do. So initially it might just be posting your favorite fruit. Um, the second thing might be posting your favorite fruit and responding to a classmate about their favorite food. Do you like it or don't like it? Um, the third thing um, that we put up for a next, you know, a future post might be posting your favorite vegetable, responding to a classmate, and also uploading a picture of it. Um, so I, I think I discussed, you know, making it um, easy in like small chunks as they're able to process each activity at a time. Because now we're not only adding the element of learning knowledge that they need in life, um, but we're also adding the element of technology system that they're not used to. So they're kind of doing two things at once. Um, so I think I'm going to move and then we can come back um, to some specific questions. And I think the majority of our teachers um, that are here are, um, are new. And I think um, from the field, I feel like a lot of us are more starting, um, are, we're, we're very much um, trying to develop connections to the technology for our students primarily. Um, but as we wrap up our course, um, at, you know, once we know, okay, we're going to close down the course online, um, we want to give them a good closing or wrap up activity. So what have they learned throughout the process um, online itself, and then take the time to remind the students of what's next. Um, what is the next step? Are they moving to the next level? Um, plan with an ending course experience. So maybe your ending course experience is just logging onto Zoom and bringing your favorite drink and sharing the experience of being online. But a good practice to end the course is to make that closing um, activity um, fun and engaging for them. Um, in order for them to come back, um, provide an opportunity for reflection on what they learned. For a lot of our students, I think, um, especially with the transition that we did so quickly, um, maybe what they're learning the most is technology itself. We're, we might be trying to teach language, but technology itself um, might be something that they're really learning as we um, move forward. So we wanna provide students with that opportunity to provide their insights of what was helpful um, and uh, what they learned, what were the core things that they learned through the course. Um, so just an engaging um, last closing activity, um, maybe something that is a good wrap up for your course. Um, one of the things I wanted to share, and this is all um, based on research is, learning, right? Um, we want to make sure that we ask the pre and post questions um, during studying. So those can be different activities. And I will also share with you um, the system that I use for my students. Um, provide words and pictures rather than just words alone. Um, the pictures and the videos are going to make a difference for your students as their learning process. Connect new information to prior information. We talked about that. Um, and we want to make sure that we present information in a context that's familiar to them. That's why some of um, the classes that just are starting to use online, it might be easier to review some of the material that they already know because they're already struggling with the technology piece um, that's being added to it. 
Um, and then encourage learners to self-explain and answer deep questions during learning. Have learners outline, summarize, and elaborate on material. Encourage individuals to test themselves or to take practice rather than restudy. Um, so the practice idea is gonna be important. I've had students, and I think we kind of meet our students halfway, um, depending on, in adult education, we provide a lot of opportunities depending on where they're at. So, I mean, there's gonna be students that may not be able to use the learning management system. Um, and, you know, for those students is, we wanna make sure we give them the same experience. Maybe they can text us a picture of their assignment, or maybe um, we can have a, conversation or you know a online meeting or a phone meeting about um, their learning process so um, we want to modify those assignments to what they're able and capable of doing um, one of the key things in technology um, we know that um, learning online um, we can cover more material so as teachers as we become more comfortable with technology um, you're going to be able to see that you're able to cover a lot more material utilizing online resources um, in the same amount of time that you did it in a face-to-face -face classroom so um, you know maybe you're you can do a lecture video about the alphabet if it's for beginning literacy ESL students um, and through that lecture video your students are able to come back and re-watch the video that you made um, rather than just having that face-to-face -face one hour lesson on the alphabet now they have a video they can come back to and listen to over and over again in order for them to enhance their learning um, those were the 10 um, main best practices for online learning. And um, what I'll do is I will um, answer some specific questions and maybe share um, some of the resources that I use for online learning, specifically to ESL teachers. Um, so I do have a site that I can share with you uh, very quickly. Let me see if I can. I'll access it. So I'm going to stop sharing for just a minute and then I'm going to come back so I can share that site with you. And then if Anthony, um, if you want to go over some of the questions while I'm pulling up that site. Sure. Um, okay, so these are uh, some questions here. Okay, so one question was um, just in terms of uh, meeting with students. Um, what about something like an office time or an office hour? Um, if they, you know, if you if a student just wants to meet with you one on one, how do you um, how do you go about accommodating that? Okay, so I personally love my office hours. So I, I do have um, office hours. Um, so I have some office hours in the morning and the evening, depending on when you want to schedule them. But for myself, um, I love Zoom. So it's the platform that we're using right now that's free to teachers. And um, what I do is I tell my students when I'm available. So if I'm available Tuesday from nine to 10, I just open up my Zoom room and they're able to come into the room if they have any questions and just kind of check in with me. Um, the other way, if uh, I have students that maybe cannot access my room, I do have the, the same time, my same office hours, I'm available by phone. So um, I, I just set up those parameters of when I'm available um, and what times I'm gonna be available. And if they want a phone appointment, I do a phone appointment. But most of my students are able to access the link and log into Zoom so we can see each other face to face. Okay, Yesenia, um, so another question is, um, you've talked to, or you've um, discussed, um, you know, maybe starting off with a texting, app like Remind or WhatsApp, um, you know, for very, very basic. You've also talked about maybe just setting up a website. Um, when it comes to LMS, um, Learning Management System, so can you tell us um, which LMS you use with your students and maybe what has been your experience with LMSs? Like, do you find that some are easier than others or maybe there's a good one to start off with? So I do, and I'm bringing it up so I can show it to you. Um, okay. 
So I've worked with a lot of different um, learning management systems. So I've worked with Moodle, um, Blackboard, Canvas. Um, I think I've done uh, just so many that are out there. Um, the one that I love to use and um, I've been using for the last year, which I'm trying to bring up, um, is going to be a program called Neo. Um, and I'm going to bring up my class. So I currently use a learning management system called Neo LMS, and I put it in the chat. Um, and I will share what that looks like. So it is a very, it's free to educators. Um, you can have up to 400 students in your class. So this is what um, my pharmacy class looks like. It's really colorful, very interactive. It has um, a capacity, um, for example, in an assignment. So let me see if I can um, bring that. In an assignment, it has the capacity to record the student's voice, to record your voice if you want to leave um, your students a message. Um, they also have uh, uh, they also have step-by-step uh, -step instructions on all of this. So, for example, um, if I'm grading this quiz and I want to leave an audio message, I'm able to leave an audio message in the comments, or I can upload a video message, and everything's pretty much done um, through the program. Um, what Neo also offers is um, it's a very interactive um, learning management system that also has a phone application. So about 90% of my students um, pretty much just do all of their learning on their phone. Um, like most of our students, their phone and their tablets have become their primary um, technology choice. So a lot of my students love Neo because it's very easy to use. It's very student and teacher friendly. So that one is my personal favorite. Although I do believe um, all learning management systems have its pros and its cons. Um, some of them, um, you know, they're, they're just all unique in their own way. And whichever management system you um, use, um, it's just, maximizing all of their, um, you know, all of the resources that they have embedded for you. Um, with Neo, it's very easy um, to build a quiz, to get a matching quiz, to put pictures where the students match the word for like literacy. Um, I have used it for literacy in the past and students, um, you know, all of my students were able to access it very easily. So, um, it's it's an easy application to use. And you're saying this, some people are having trouble hearing. So it's called Neo, Neo. N is in Nancy, E is in Edward, O is in Oscar. Oh, yeah, it's a, <laughs> yes, Neo LMS. Um, and let me see yes. if I can get a link and I can put it in the chat. And um, you saying there was a question. Do you have, um, do you know anything about the cost? Is there or is there a free version, no, a freemium, or um, Neo is free to all educators um, and up to 400 students. So if you have more than 400 students, um, then you know you would need to purchase like a school account, but uh, teachers can sign up for it individually and it's free. So if you just have a teacher account, then it's free for up to 400 students. Okay, and for those, um, the, uh, you're saying you just put the, the uh, URL in the chat, mm -hmm. so it's www.neolms.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're saying you have a question about that. Can you have multiple classes in Neo? Yeah, yeah, so you can have multiple classes up to 400. So if you teach, you know, three different levels, you can build those three um, different levels. Um, it's also um, easy to export and import. So say, for example, you are using um, Moodle and you all have all your quizzes in there already. You can export those quizzes and upload them into Neo just the same way, like if you're not going to use Neo anymore, you can export all of your lessons and then put them into a different learning management system. Um, it works really well. It integrates really well with Google Classroom, um, and it integrates really well with a lot of the other um, technology, you know, like technology for education that's out there um, to deliver instruction. Okay, great. Um, okay, so um, you said you just uh, uh, 
a little break for you for just a second. We have had some questions about uh, certificates and we have um, addressed that in the chat. So basically we are taking attendance at all the OTAN webinars. Um, we're a little backed up in terms of recording attendance in our database system, but as, um, as soon as we can get to it, we will be issuing certificates for, well, actually maybe I'll have Melinda come on and talk about that a little bit later, but we are recording attendance. If you ever have questions about certificates or attendance, you can always email OTAN support at OTAN.us. Um, so that's that. Um, Yesenia, so maybe there were, again, some questions. So let's kind of circle back to this question about um, student um, digital literacy skills and, and teacher, actually for that matter, teacher digital literacy skills as well. So for everybody who's starting out, teachers and students who don't really have, you know, a lot of digital literacy skills, zero digital <laughs> literacy skills, um, not very confident in their digital liter literacy abilities. Um, you know, where do you where do you start in this process, or and what do you focus on in terms of best practices? For literacy students, I think it's the most um, difficult to um, access and. Um, a lot of our learning material because of the language barrier. Um, although I feel a lot of our students are able to um, kind of figure out technology on their phones um, or on their computers, most of them um, are able to somehow utilize their phone or computer to um, do something. Um, so I think the easiest thing, again, um, as I said earlier, is utilizing a website that's already built um, where they just have to follow a link. Um, or if, you know, um, if you're going to make a simple activity, it's going to be utilizing a program that's very simple for them um, where you can even just send them a video of yourself um, teaching, you know, a couple of vocabulary words and you just send out your video link and they're able to click on it. Um, so for those students, um, just making um, the process very simple is going to be utilizing things that they already know how to utilize, which most of the time is going to be um, the texting apps that a lot of our teachers are currently using um, to try and help our students um, learn. Um, because those are just follow the link, right? Click on the link and follow the link. So that's going to be easy. Um, so for example, I'm going to put the link for the picture dictionary on the comment. So once we provide our students with a link, just like I did right now, um, you're just texting out that link. Um, and they are able to click on it, right? If it's a link to a video um, that you want them to watch, like maybe for a higher level learner, um, you want to send them a TED talk that's already on YouTube, then you would just send the link to that YouTube TED talk send them the link and then ask a question. Um, you know, what did they learn or what specifically um, did you want them to take out of that um, YouTube video or that TED talk that you sent them out to them? Um, so it just depends, um, I think, as far as the technology needs and then the literacy students, um, what they're able to access during that time. So I wanted to share really quickly, which I have, um, and I still have to update because I have, uh, haven't added all of the links that I want to add. And I'll share my website um, with you too. So I do have a website that has um, some ESL resources. So these are some of the links that I sometimes um, send my students. Um, and it's just a couple of my favorite websites. Um, and I'll send you the link. So this is my um, Google site. Um, and these are just some of the links that I share with my students. And sometimes it's just the link I send and then a specific activity I want them to do. Um, but this is going to be uh, something that you can put together, like maybe you are just sending them, uh, you know, a, a page with links, maybe you just want to send one link at a time, um, but providing the students with the links um, is usually the easiest um, route. Um, if you're using a learning management system, then um, you're more embedding and creating a course online. If you're just using websites, then it just, um, you know, you're, you're just using the resources that are available out there. And um, I'm sure people have a 
events um, on the OTAN website, Yesenia will be able to add, yes. we, we can add um, Yesenia's slides, and then also if um, the website that she just showed us, we can also put the link to the website in there as well. Um, so that'll be available after we finish up today. Um, and I think, Yesenia, um, really quick, sorry, Anthony. And I think yeah. one of the things that our teachers um, might um, be interested in, and really utilizing OTAN because I know there is a seminar on how to build your Google Sites. I think Google Sites, um, if you can just provide your students with one link to your site um, and you have resources up there, you can upload worksheets, you can upload videos. If they just have that one link that they need to go to to access all of your materials, um, then you're not really um, teaching them a bunch of different um, resources. You're just, they just have to go to one link to access you. And then you can build your Google website to, um, you know, to kind of um, customize it to what you want your class to learn, whether it's a beginning literacy class or an advanced class. Um, you can build a lot of things onto your Google website to kind of customize it to your student needs. Um, Yesenia, um, just back on the topic of discussion forums. So you mentioned how when you're working in the LMS, you know, for, let, for example, Neo or Moodle or Canvas or whatever, mm -hmm. um, there is the discussion forum uh, function or tool that's built into the LMS. But do you recommend any other tools, tech tools for discussion, you know, a discussion forum like set up you know for example um somebody mentioned like padlet for example but do you have any other ideas about tools we could use for discussions well there's there's lots of tools that you can use i think it just depends um you know how many tools you want to use um for myself i find it easier just to work with neil and google classroom um to kind of share different things um, because remember, as you're utilizing and adding more tools, those are more tools that you need to learn as an instructor and that your students need to learn um, to use as well. Um, but there's definitely a lot of different tools. Um, Padlet is amazing. Um, you know, there's different discussion tools that we can utilize um, to help um, our students. I mean, Google has Google Blogs that we can utilize to, to blog um, with our students. So there's just so many tools out there that we can use. Um, I think our teachers need to choose a tool that they want to use or that they really like um, and focus on uh, maximizing that tool with their students because um, we don't wanna give them too many tools in a short amount of time, right? Um, especially uh, students that are struggling with technology already. Yesenia, um would you be able to add a add the link to your Google site in the yeah. chat? Okay. And as I've been telling a few people in the Q and A, we also um, I think I just said this too, but we'll add the link to we'll add links to Yesenia's slides and her Google site on the OTAN um, COVID nineteen field support page. Um, let me go back. Let me just see if we need any other questions we need to address here. Um, okay, um, you just added the chat, uh, sorry, added the link to her website in the uh, chat, so it's a bit.ly, so bit.ly, and then there's a slash, and whenever you use bit.ly, folks, anything after the slash is case sensitive, you have to type it exactly as is, so capital M, R, S, Capital D E L G A D O, Mrs. Delgado. And it's in the chat. Um, we can put it there again. And we'll put it on the OTAN COVID page. Um, so, folks, we have a few minutes left here. Yusenia, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to just show people the, the OTAN website just yes, quickly. Yes, please. Okay. And Yusenia is um, now. Showing her, showing her face, I say. Yeah. So I'm gonna um, take over the screen here. Give me one second. I have to find my, where are we here? Okay, hi everyone. Actually, I didn't introduce myself, Anthony Bjork at OTAN. So I just wanted to um, point out for folks a couple of things. Um, I'm showing you, and hopefully you can see the OTAN 
homepage at OTAN.us, OTAN.us again. So we have just posted our upcoming activities for, the, um, for this week. Um, so we have, uh, actually we have office hours later today, Monday, one o'clock. We actually do office hours now three times a week, Mondays, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So if you have very specific questions, you can come and join us in the OTAN office hours. Have, we'll take any and all questions there. Um, and then you should see the lineup for upcoming webinars this week as well. So we have a pretty full schedule. Um, you can sign up for any and all of these sessions um, from the home page. But on the, on the right hand side, you should see this COVID-19 field support button. If you click this button, Sorry, I was just uh, looking at the chat here. Close that. Um, if you look at the COVID-19 uh, field support button, so I just want to point out things for people. Um, under the OTAN section, we are um, uh, working as quickly as we can to post recordings and materials from previous webinars um, in this previous OTAN webinars table. So as I mentioned, um, we'll, we're going to get Yesenia's um, recording and resources up on this table as quickly as we can. We're, we have a bit of a backlog, as you can imagine, over the last couple of weeks, but we're working to get everything up on this table. So um, check back at the table to get those resources and website links and all that. We also have our own OTAN resource guide. It's the first item under OTAN. So if I click on that and I open the guide, and hopefully you can see this. Um, actually, we've gone ahead and uh, majorly reorganized this guide. If, you, if you've seen it in the last couple of weeks, it, it was just kind of one continuous stream. Um, we're trying to get a little bit organized, uh, more organized here, but I did want to point out on the first page because there were many questions about the digital skills of my students and my teachers and myself and all that. We have added a list of websites that you might consider looking at and sharing with students that have to do with acquiring these basic digital literacy skills. So a lot of you know GCF Learn Free. That's a great site to, um, that, that covers a lot of ground on computer basics, email basics, internet basics, all that kind of stuff. And they try to keep the language pretty simple. They try to add screenshots as well so you can kind of see what, you're, what they're discussing. There are a number of other sites that you can take a look at, digitallearn.org, digitalliteracy.gov, Tech Boomers. These are also good sites that have a lot of information that cover the basic ground. So if you are able to share these kinds of links with your students so that they can practice on their end, Yesenia was telling us about, you know, maybe the most important thing that we focus on at the moment is just teaching, you know, these digital literacy skills that are super important. Um, and then we move into the content in time. So this is another place to look for some sites that might be helpful for your instruction. Um, so I'll leave it at that.